Um, so it's from a young guy. Um, I'm just going to call him. Well, his name is Josh, but I won't say his surname because I don't kind of know if he wants it to be anonymous or not. Um, I did. I did email him back and say we're going to read this out, but I'll keep you anonymous unless you want me to say your name. He didn't respond to that bit, so I won't give his full name. But it's really short and snappy. But I think it's um, something that a lot of people will hopefully benefit from. So it says becoming a tour pro, dear Rick. I recently turned 16 and I'm currently playing off an 11 handicap and I aspire to become a tour pro. I know that being off an 11 handicap at 16 will make a lot of people immediately say that there's no way of becoming a tour pro, but I've set a goal to become a three handicap by October the 1st. The weakest part of my game is within 100 yards, pitching, chipping and putting. How do I improve this? How do I get down to three? And any tips on um, drills, etc., would really help. So I was thinking initially... Your massive forte is tips, drills, etc. from 100 yards and in. I want to cover that first. And then I've got a little angle, and then I think I want you to bounce in off the back of it because I think you'll be able to expand on that massively. Okay. So first off, Josh, being 16 and being off 11, obviously you're right in saying that if, if you said that to a lot of people, I would say the majority of people would say you've got no chance mm-hmm. of making it out yeah. at all. That's just because of perception. When you look at, like, we talk spoke about it last week like tiger woods coming through the ranks at 16 he probably won x amount of events and all you know it's crazy when you look at the youth and the talent that there is available um so let, let's we'll break it down into short game first i think that one of the big things when you're practicing short game and, and working on 100 yards and in you've got to make it very much pressure based so you look at someone like um francesco molinari who had a really interesting weekend um he topped a shot and then also got a, a, a violation on a rules a, a violation. And weirdly, his rules violation was a, from the guy who I'm just going to talk about. So James Ridgard, yeah. who is um, Francesco Molinari's coach, short game coach, but also this week at the AT&T acted as caddy. At one of the shots actually stood behind Francesco Molinari while he was in a bunker and you're not allowed to stand directly behind the line. But as a coach, that's quite a natural place to stand. Yeah. Somebody phoned in on, after seeing it on TV and Francesco Molinari ended up getting a two-shot penalty. Flipping but either way, why I bring that subject up because I find it really interesting. Whenever I see those two working together, share a bit on social media, it's always really game-based mm-hmm. and always really pushing the the uh, idea of, of difficulty level. So it'll never just be stood in the bunker on a perfectly flat lie playing to a perfect Yeah, in a flag. standard shot. He'll mix it up where the bunk, the ball is plugged in the face and he's got an awkward stance. He's got to get to a really tight pin. But then the very next shot, his ball might be out of the bunker, but he's got to be stood in the bunker. And it, it, so it's like real golf, isn't it, real, essentially? Real, real golf. Yeah. And learning those skills, not from a technical standpoint. I'm sure they do work on technique from a soul. Uh, let's video on camera and making sure everything's perfect. But after that, it's all gameplay. It's all really kind of manipulated gameplay, which makes it very interesting. So when, like say, he's out on the golf course, he's learning into the, to adapt to those situations so i think that's really important don't get bogged down in in just soul what i would class as block practice block practice you stood on one position you're hitting 100 golf balls in the same location it's almost like technique i guess that more than actually practice yeah isn't it? and there's, there's an element of that yeah and you do need a bit of that but then break away and get into much more of a game scenario where you're trying to really test yourself and if you really want to get down to, to three handicap in october that's what you've got to get really good at it's not stood on driving range hitting perfect 100 100 yard shots on a perfect flat lie it's been in situations and testing yourself under pressure so when you get out on the golf course and you've got to perform for the next 10 months whatever it's going to be till the first of october you have got a massive advantage against the golf course because that's what you're kind of getting yourself ready for yeah so that's the kind of short game side of it um and then going back to this kind of question 11 year old and i know you've got some sorry 16 sorry, 11 uh, 16 year old playing off 11 handicap there are obviously probably I would say that the, the stats are stacked against you if you were just to take it on paper. But you look at a lot of professionals have actually came into the game much, much later. Like there's a lot of golf yeah. professionals who actually, you know, someone like an Ian Poulter was off four when he was eighteen when he did his PGA training, ended up becoming a PGA professional, obviously. You look at someone like Colin Montgomery, one of the famous ones, he only started really playing golf seriously when he was 18 years old and i'm sure there's many more examples as well um so it's, it's never you're never going to make it but the next two or three years are really important yeah and that's because obviously i grew up in the gender junior golf team as did you and i was lucky enough to play with some golfers who've gone on to be on tour and i've also known or known of players who were the next big thing who didn't go on to make it so i think 
you've answered that question perfectly about how he could get his short game, you know, how could he improve that? Basically, in a, in a long story short, is practice more real shots, isn't it? But I actually took some time, as you probably tell from this answer now, over the weekend to think about this, because again, it, it's something that resonates with me as a junior at the age of 16. Being a golfer was my absolute ambition, which obviously I didn't, didn't fulfil. But a couple of questions I wanted to ask him or put towards him was, he said he's 16, he's off 11. If he's been playing since he was four, that might not be that impressive. If he's been playing for a year, for two years, that could be, he may have only picked up clubs in lockdown, for example. And, you know, there's a lot of different scenarios. So your handicap isn't always the be all and end all because it doesn't give us enough insight into how talented he actually is. Equally, you know, there could be a guy now, and there will be, who are 16 and off plus two, off plus three, or even off plus four. That's fantastic. But if a 16 year old is off plus four, stops improving, that's not good enough to get on tour. Whereas equally, if Josh improves every year by three or four shots for the next five, six years, he could be, well, you know, whatever it might be, more than that, but he might be good enough to get on tour. So handicap alone isn't really the be-all and end-all. That's the first thing I'd say. But another thing, and this, you know, just, just some examples was, you might remember this, there was a guy who was 16, I think, who played in the PJ Tour called Ty Tryon in like the early 2000s. I remember that name. Who was meant to be the absolute next big thing and didn't massively fulfil what he was due to do. And on the other side of the coin, I've, I have known golfers who weren't amazing juniors, but then have gone on to make a career in golf. And one example, actually, you might know Tom Murray, who's Andrew yeah, Murray's yeah. son. Yep. I remember as a junior, I was a low enough handicap to enter the Faldo series, which was obviously the Nick Faldo, kind of where all the big guys were playing, all the good juniors. But I was never low enough to get through the ballot. So there was one year at Heaton Park in Manchester, they had a, a competition for people that were low enough, but not low enough to get in the ballot. And one person who won each age group got like through. And I was heard of Tom Murray. So at the time, he was obviously a good junior, but he wasn't amazing. He wasn't even good enough to get into the Faldo series straight off. And I played with him, and his dad, Andrew Murray, who's running the European tour, walked around with us. And, I, and he played quite well, Tom, and he actually got through. But I think, again, he was a bit older than me. He was off about four or five. He wasn't great, but he's since gone on to play on the European tour. He's won on the Challenge tour. So that, you know, it can still happen. But another thing, and then obviously I want you to jump in as well here, but would be it's hard like, to think, think like at 16, but he wants to have a dream and have a goal and have ambition. Do that, you know, focus on the PGA Tour, the European Tour, because, you know, it's good to have a dream and ambition at such a young age. But also, he should look at golf a bit more holistically and think, right, my goal at the top of the pyramid is to be a European Tour player. But also, I'd love to just work in golf. So I would like to be a, a club pro with an amazing fitting business or an amazing coaching business. Do I want to be a golf content creator? Do you want to be a sales rep for TaylorMade, for Ping, for Callaway? So don't just see it that it's either that or nothing. There's other avenues in golf that could be an amazing career, and I'd like to think I'm, I'm lucky enough to have done that. I wanted to be a player. I was nowhere near good enough, but now working golf. And then lastly on this, and this is, again, it's quite hard to think about when you're only 16, but if he's 11 handicap at 16, he's a very good player. So there's two things to think about. Firstly, you're going to be better than most your mates who will also probably end up playing golf the next 5, 10 years. So you've already got a great standard, which is good. You'll be thankful for that. But also, you can be playing with a lot of gents at the golf club, males or females who are business people who've got um, good connections and stuff like that. So we should also think about, and again, it's hard, but just learning from adults, social skills, conversation skills, get to, you know, he might leave school and, and get offered a job by an amazing guy at his golf club who's a businessman because he knows how much of a nice lad he is and stuff. So there's a, there's a lot of other benefits being a good junior golfer than having to get on tour or not. I think you rounded that up really nicely. And, and that's the things that potentially people don't always look past, like you say. And I, I think, you again, you addressed it brilliantly. You've got this goal at the very top of the tree, and that's what you're aiming for. And I understand this very much one-track mind. And if you take your mind and you focus off that, you might slip up. But just have this in mind that golf is a fantastic sport. And if you don't quite reach it into tour, like Guy mentioned, there's so many different ways you can filter down into the world of golf yeah. and, be, and still be. I, I'm blessed I get to put my golf shoes every day and, and call this my job, you mm -hmm. know. And as much as my my career, my job's kind of taken a, a completely different path than what I fully expected. Um, be open-minded to change as well because, you know, it is, it is an opportunity. And... and hopefully josh continues and pushes hard and and does reach his goals whatever that may be but also there's lots of pga pros who have made it on tour lasted a year and then yeah. kind of vanished and now don't work in golf at all so because they might not have taken any more interest in other aspects of golf um so i think sometimes when when tour players don't get on tour i've seen it loads of times before they almost look down on teaching people yeah they don't see it as their job they like it's like oh, i have to now go and I've teach got, yeah. somebody 
where if you actually almost create a passion for that in the background, if you don't make it on tour, at least you can jump out and go, well, I've still got a passion in yeah, this. Yeah. I actually really like helping, you know, golfers get better in whatever that way that may be. So yeah, think of it, Josh, and hopefully you'll remember this chat from the Richfield's Golf Show podcast. And uh, when you pick up that green jacket, you'll uh, give us a little name drop. Exactly. And that's the thing though. There's also, as I said, there's a lot of exciting jobs in golf. You know, every brand has got salespeople, marketing people, custom fitters, um, you know, people that work in the R&D teams in the States, people like Chris Trott works for TaylorMade, who's literally, his job is to literally work with Rory and Dustin Johnson and build golf clubs for them. So, but ultimately, without being rude, all these people we're mentioning are all essentially failed tour pros. Yeah. We all wanted to be tour pros, yeah, didn't yeah. we? None of us At have done point, it, or very yeah. few of us have done it. So, yeah. Um, should we get on to the main course?